In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome today to Central United Methodist Church. Whether you're worshiping with us in person here in the sanctuary or worshiping with us by live stream, we've chosen, uh, glad you've chosen to make this a part of your day today. And I should say happy St. Patrick's Day to you. It's good to see all the green out there. Meg, uh, Meg was trying to convince me that we should wear our green stoles today instead of purple, but I said, Meg, that would not be appropriate. And no, that was, oh, wait a minute. No, that was me that said that to you. Is that how that worked? No, it is good to see you today um, for this time of worship. And as we gather now together, we gather in the presence of Christ. So let us now open our hearts to Christ's presence with us as we worship God in spirit and in truth. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. They shall be like snow, though they are red like crimson. Please be seated. O oh God, our Deliverer, you led your people of old through the wilderness and brought them to the Promised Land. Guide now the people of your Church, that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the letter to the Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 3. Hear now the word of God. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Life is full of uncertainties. This season of Lent reminds us that, I think at times, to examine maybe the things we assume to be certain and new. It calls us to prepare as well for those spiritual uncertainties so that we have the spiritual tools to carry on and to continue to grow in God's love and grace when those uncertain things come our way. There's a quote, I'm sure he didn't, uh, he attributed it to someone else, but the man I heard say this quote is uh, football coach Lou Holtz who said, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you deal with it. And that struck me as true, that how we deal with the uncertainties that life brings to us is how we deal with those uncertainties is maybe even more important than the uncertainty happening in and of itself. And to make sure there in this season of Lent, I think how we, we're called to examine how our spiritual lives prepare us spiritually for those uncertainties when they surely come. I reflected on this idea when thinking about an experience that my son and I had last summer. Uh, he and I were uh, in the dead of summer. Uh, we were at some, I think, beginning of August, we were on a trip, uh, where a little hiking trip that we planned. We, drove to that corner of South Carolina, where South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia all come together. And we were going to uh, hike into a spot that I'd been to before um, on the Chattooga River and spend a few days camping and fishing. But it meant hiking into this spot. Now, this is a spot I'd been to two or three times, I, or actually three times. I knew exactly where it was. I could walk right to it. I knew everything about where we were going. And so we parked to the place I'd been before. By the way, you should note that when we parked, the thermometer on my dashboard said that it was 98 degrees. This is in the mountains, so it was hot, is what I'm saying. And we started walking. It's about a five mile walk in to where we were going to camp, up this trail, this well-worn trail. But as we hiked, we noticed the trail had didn't seem to be as well traveled. We, there was one other car parked at the trailhead and that was from somebody who was fishing down near the bridge in the river. So nobody else at least had a car parked at that trail, particular trailhead where we were hiking. And we began to drink water and drink water and drink water, bearing in mind we're carrying backpacks loaded with gear. So we're, we're heavy exercise with heavy weight and we drank water until uh, I, anyway, was out of water. Harper did a better job of drinking. We get to a, about halfway point to where we plan to camp, and there's a place where a huge tree had fallen. It didn't fall across the trail. It had fallen when I mean, it did, but it fell in such a way that the root ball, and the root ball itself is probably 15 feet across, a huge tree, had pulled the trail up. So you had mountain here, mountain here, and a trail sort of cut into the side of the ridge, but this tree had pulled the trail up. So now it's just a steep slope that goes all the way down to the river. And he and I had been, now we dealt with the uncertainty of heat, and now we have the uncertainty of what are we going to do to get around this? And we decided that we would kind of crawl through this root ball and hand one another our backpacks, which we did. Uh, I almost fell off the mountain hiking in. He did for hiking out, but we're both still here uninjured. And when we finally got to where we were going to go, still not seeing any other people, we began to ask ourselves, is the trail closed? Did we miss the sign? 
Is this some sort of COVID thing that we don't know about? Is it like mountain COVID that, that closes trails? We, don't, we were trying to figure it out. The whole few days that we were camped, we never saw another soul. So we dealt with dehydration. We dealt with an out trail, but we carried on. We fished. We didn't catch a lot of fish, but we had a lot of fun. I think about uncertainties in sort of in, in that way. We can either let them turn us around, we can either let them ruin whatever we have going on, or we can figure out how to work around them. These verses speak about uncertainty. What do we do when we are confronted by things we cannot prove or measure? And there are uncertainties if we're honest about Jesus. For example, there are some things we can say independent of the Bible using other historical sources about a man named Jesus, that there was a man named Jesus, that he lived during this period of time in this particular place, that he had a, a ministry of teaching and preaching, that he led a religious movement of which we're the 21st century incarnation. We can say independent of the Bible that he preached and taught a better way to live, that he challenged oppressive structures both in religion and in government. And we can also say that he was executed on false charges. We can say all that without the Bible. But we're left short with the uncertain things about Jesus. Jesus left no record. Jesus didn't write anything. But we are still called to trust in the witness of Scripture that though Jesus didn't write anything in his life that we have anyway, that we've received, we do have these witnesses these, uh, that, that saw and experienced and heard Jesus in their lives and they wrote those experiences down under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and those experiences come to us as the New Testament. From those witnesses that we call Scripture, there are things that we are called that are uncertain, but that we're nevertheless asked to put our faith in. For example, we cannot say with certainty that Jesus was born of a virgin named Mary, that he's the Son of God, that he performed miracles, healed the sick, cast out evil spirits, that he rose from the grave, that he ascended to heaven. Those are things that might seem uncertain, that might seem hard to accept, because those are things that our senses and our experience of the world tell us don't happen. Our experience of the world and the uncertainties of Jesus' life and the uncertainty that accepting certain truths about Jesus might trigger a sense of uncertainty within us. That's where faith comes in. Hebrews here defines faith. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And I think these words about faith as we draw closer to Holy Week and Easter, these verses telling us about faith can come to us as a word of encouragement as we prepare to celebrate the holiest things about Jesus, his death and his resurrection, and the uncertainty with which we might meet those things. But we have to, I think, acknowledge if we're going to accept those things about Jesus, that even if we look outside of our relationship with God, there are things that we cannot measure or prove. There are things in our everyday lives that we're asked to accept on faith, aren't there? How does someone else feel about me? Someone might tell you they love you, they might do everything to act like they love you, but how can you be sure what's truly in another person's heart? What's truly in another person's mind? Does that not require faith? Or in a smaller way, I look at my dog all the time and I say, what is she thinking? She just wants Ellen to come home. She's only paying attention to me until Ellen gets home. I joke that Ellen is the object of all affection when it comes to this dog. And, 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 but then there's sometimes I come home and she's excited to see me. Big ways and in small ways, we're required 
in daily life to use a degree of faith. As Hebrews says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. There are things that we cannot prove. There are things that we cannot measure in our everyday lives, but that's certainly true of our relationship with Jesus as well. Lent comes as this annual reminder calling us to recommit ourselves to the things that feed our faith. What are those things that feed our faith? As I said, we all know about Jesus. And all we really can know about Jesus comes to us from the witness of Scripture. Does that mean that, as some cynics would say, that Jesus' first followers made up a religion based on their teacher? No, no, that's not what it means at all. We can trust these witnesses. We can trust these folks' experience of Jesus and how it informs and shapes our experience of Jesus. Whenever anybody pushes on me, that pushes me on this idea, I'll repeat something I learned from my New Testament professor, Luke Timothy Johnson, who whenever anybody asks, well, what can you really say with certainty about Jesus? He looks at them and he says, do you believe in Socrates? And that usually floors them. Socrates, the Greek philosopher, one that is considered one of the fathers of Western thought. Socrates wrote nothing. Socrates left no record of himself. Everything we know about Socrates, we know from his followers, especially Plato. Does that mean Socrates isn't, wasn't real? Does that mean Socrates didn't teach the things he taught? I don't know anybody who's trying to challenge the existence of Socrates. So how much more then can we trust the witnesses about Jesus with the authors of the New Testament by the guidance of the Holy Spirit wrote to share with us their experiences of Jesus with us and for us. There's some things we cannot prove, but there's some things we can nevertheless experience. We can know about Jesus who loves us and who's for us when we read about him in the Bible. We can experience Jesus in our lives. And I can't prove to you that Jesus died our death and rose for our sake, but I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that he did. I can't prove that God loves you so much that he sent Jesus for you, but I believe with every fiber of my being that he did. So I call us as we close in on these holiest days of the Christian year to examine what is it that we do that feeds our faith? What is it we can do to show up those places within us that when the uncertainties of life come our way, we have the spiritual tools to deal with them? And friends, I dare say one of them is to read this book. Read these words that God has inspired people to write so that we can know about Jesus who loves us. So that those things, though they cannot be proven, we can nevertheless hear those who give witness to the truth of Jesus. And we might have an experience of Jesus in this life, a spiritual experience of Jesus in our here and now that empowers us, that makes us draw closer to God and enables us to deal with the uncertainties of life, <clears throat> excuse me, when they come. I think of that sort of spiritual preparedness is necessary for us to deal with things as they happen, as life unfolds. So as we close in on the end of Lent, let's hear from those witnesses, those witnesses to Jesus who lived and died and rose again for you. And let's open our hearts to the presence of Jesus with us even now that we might have that experience of him in our lives, an experience that is deepened and grows from seeking the things of God. Let's look to Jesus. Let's look to Jesus. And let's make real for us 
the words that Hebrews offers, that faith is the assurance, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And I invite you to say with me our closing prayer as found in your order of worship. Stay with us, great God, in the joys and difficulties of this day. Remember us when we are in trouble for Christ's sake. Remember us also when we forget you in the easy times. And every time defend us from evil. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you stand for the benediction as you're able? May God's peace keep us safe in union with Christ Jesus. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name we pray. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>